Rembrandt Harmanson van Rijn was buried in Amsterdam's Westerkerk on the 8th of October 1669. None of the tombstones betrays where precisely he was laid to rest, and this is not the only puzzle which the Dutch painter left behind. His rich and complex work led soon after his death to the appearance of myths and legends. The painter's life and work have still not been completely deciphered. When we look at his paintings today, we're looking at the work of a great artistic personality surrounded by an air of fascination and mystery. Rembrandt, master of light and shadow. Rembrandt's ancestors had settled in the Dutch town of Leiden in the 15th century. His father was a miller and part owner of a windmill in the town. On the 15th of July, 1606, his mother gave birth to her ninth child, who was christened Rembrandt. It was an unusual first name even then, and later it allowed the painter to use it as a signature without any danger of confusion. The Van Rijn family was not poor, though life was certainly not secure. At this period, the northern Dutch provinces had been waging a war of independence against Spain for 40 years. They were struggling against religious and economic oppression. Three years after Rembrandt's birth, a 12-year truce was signed, and when that expired, the war was largely confined to naval battles and border skirmishes. Rembrandt's brothers were apprenticed to millers, bakers or shoemakers, but the parents sent their youngest child at the age to a Protestant grammar school, where he learned Latin. When he was 14, Rembrandt enrolled at Leiden's renowned university. But he can hardly have done much studying, because at the same time he begged his parents to apprentice him to a painter. His wish was fulfilled, and he became a pupil of the local artist Jakob von Swanenborg. He had recently returned after a long stay in Italy. During this period, he had painted numerous scenes of witches and hell. A Catholic, he taught Rembrandt how to translate human feelings into pictures, how to use light and dark to distinguish the essentials from the incidental. After completing his apprenticeship, the young Rembrandt went to Amsterdam for the first time. There, his father thought it proper to spend more money on him and take him to the famous painter Peter Lastman, who lived in Amsterdam, in order for him to receive further instruction. Peter Lastman had also spent time in Italy, where he'd made a thorough study of the pictures of Caravaggio. In Amsterdam, he had an outstanding reputation. Rembrandt was one of his many fans. He knew the picture of Balaam and the ass, which tells of the prophet whose ass refused to proceed because she had recognized the angel of God. Balaam beat her until she began to talk. Then his eyes too were opened. Last man's version lacks the dynamism of Rembrandt's picture. Rembrandt painted the motif four years after joining his new master. He concentrated the figures more strongly in one part of the picture. The prophet is seen with one arm raised to bring it down with a mighty wallop. Last man's Balaam looks almost clumsy by contrast. Rembrandt's presentation is far more dramatic. The ass is turning her head towards Balaam as though she were trying to prevent the blow, seeking eye contact as she opens her mouth. Rembrandt probably spent no more than six months with Lastman before returning to his hometown of Leiden. 
There he set up a studio in this house. Soon, younger and the child prodigy of the age. He'd begun his training as a painter when just eight, and he too had studied under Peter Lustmann. He had far more experience than Rembrandt, but his friendship resulted in close and fruitful artistic cooperation. This is Levin's portrait of Rembrandt at the age of about 18. In 1628, the statesman and connoisseur Constantine Huygens came to Leiden. In his autobiography, he has much to say about the two young artists. For Huygens, Rembrandt was the better narrative painter of the two. In the picture, Palamides before Agamemnon, dating from 1626, Rembrandt followed the contemporary artistic practice of including himself in the picture in order to get a better feeling for the story. Half hidden by the ruler's scepter, we see the face that he was to paint and draw so often in the years to come. Even at this early age, he drew numerous self-portraits, most of them in the form of etchings. He sought to find the right expression for different moods, and he succeeded in plumbing the variety, ambiguity, and also the ambivalence of human emotion. Rembrandt's painting of Samson and Delilah. For this Old Testament story, Rembrandt had chosen the moment when Samson has fallen asleep in Delilah's lap after revealing that he owes his superhuman strength to his long hair. Delilah indicates to the Philistine creeping up behind her that he should cut off Samson's hair. Not only is the composition fascinating, so is the treatment of the different materials. Rembrandt ground his own pigments, unusual for a painter at that time, and he manipulated them so that the fabrics, for example, come across as real cloth rather than paint. In Leiden, Rembrandt took on the first apprentices of his own. Even then, he charged a hundred guilders a year, board and lodging not included. Later, he would head a large studio with some 50 assistants and apprentices. Rembrandt's father, immortalized in this etching, died in April 1630. By now, Rembrandt's own reputation had spread far beyond Leiden. He gave expression to his growing self-confidence in a portrait in which he gazes at the beholder, calm and relaxed. For the first time, he wears a hauberk, the part of a suit of armour that protects the neck. Maybe this is a hint that he had connections at court in The Hague. Meanwhile, his links with Amsterdam grew deeper. Time and again, he went there to see the art dealer Hendrik van Eulenburg in order to execute commissions which the latter had arranged for him. Rembrandt and Jan Lievens finally left their hometown. Lievens went to London and Rembrandt to Amsterdam. Amsterdam was Holland's major port and trading center. He could expect more commissions here than in Leiden. For the Stadtholder, the governor in The Hague, Rembrandt painted a scene from classical mythology, the rape of Proserpina. 
Pluto, the god of the underworld, is dragging Proserpina onto his chariot. She is struggling furiously while her companions are trying to keep hold of her and thus frustrate the god. The landscape, bathed in darkness, gives a foretaste of the underworld in which Proserpina must now live. While still in Leiden, Rembrandt had acquired shares in Hendrik van Eulenborg's art business in Amsterdam. Now he moved into the dealer's house. Eulenborg arranged commissions for portraits of Amsterdam citizens, while Rembrandt taught at Eulenborg's art school. He also had a share in the profits of the business. On St. Antonismarkt in Amsterdam, there's a large, fortress-like building, the Antonisbarg. This was the headquarters of the Painters and Surgeons Guild. The building also housed the Anatomy Hall. Every year, the president of the Surgeons Guild gave a public lecture, at which he would dissect the body of an executed criminal. In 1632, Rembrandt was commissioned to paint Dr. Tulp's anatomy lesson. He saw this commission as a challenge. He left the diagonally placed corpse almost intact, grouping the members of the guild in a semicircle around it. One is looking very intently at the tendons of the hand. They are all dressed in brown coats with large collars, hatless, and gazing with interest at the corpse or the lecturer. One holds a sheet of paper with explanatory notes, perhaps. Dr. Tulp himself is dressed in black. His lace collar is much smaller than the others. Rembrandt uses his clothes and hat to distinguish him as the main character. For the first time, the artist links the group portrait genre with the depiction of an event. The scene did not actually look like this, but reflects the laws of artistic composition. The integration of a group portrait into an action scene was a big hit in Amsterdam. Rembrandt was now flooded with commissions. He became a citizen of Amsterdam and joined the Guild of St. Luke, an association of painters. Both steps were obligatory before he could set up a studio of his own. It was at this time that he portrayed himself as the successful painter in velvet cap and fur collar. Only the right-hand side of his face is illuminated, creating a vitality which marks him out as an experienced portraitist. In 1633, Rembrandt got to know his dealer's niece, Saskia Eulenborg, the daughter of a prosperous family from the province of Frisia. Here, he has painted her in a particularly elaborate historical costume. The features of the patrician's daughter really seem to reveal her character. Rembrandt and Saskia wed in June 1634. The artist had succeeded in marrying above his station. The young couple lived at first with Hendrik Eulenburg and then rented a house where Rembrandt could set up his own studio. Before meeting Saskia, he had hardly painted any young women, but he often portrayed his wife in a domestic setting and depicted her in many of his narrative pictures. Often, the historical references were not recognized. The paintings were mistaken for pictures of the couple's own extravagant lifestyle. For example, this picture of the prodigal son in the brothel was for a long time misinterpreted in this way. In fact, the artist was simply using himself and his wife as models to illustrate the biblical story. Unlike his contemporaries, Rembrandt integrated Saskia into the work of his studio. She was the model for many of his figures.
Rembrandt could certainly afford an extravagant lifestyle. A prosperous citizen of Amsterdam, he bought a house for 13,000 guilders. Within the space of five years, Saskia gave birth to four children. None survived for more than two months, with the exception of Titus, the youngest, whom Rembrandt painted many times. The Blinding of Samson, dating from 1636. Never before had Rembrandt depicted cruelty in such a gruesome fashion. In the foreground, Samson is set upon and blinded by the Philistines. Meanwhile, Delilah hurries away with his cut-off hair. Rembrandt had painted this Old Testament story years before, but then he had chosen a calm moment, albeit a tense one, before Samson had lost his hair and with it his strength. Now he knew how to compose the scene in order to portray the violence convincingly. In the John the Baptist preaching, a great crowd of people, including Africans, Asians and Native Americans, has come down to the Jordan to be baptized. Here too, Rembrandt depicted members of his family. The painter too is listening to the sermon. The picture was probably originally intended as the basis for an etching, which however was never executed. On the open market, a picture like this, with many narrative details, would doubtless have sold very well. Rembrandt was now at the height of his career. He portrayed himself in a stylish costume of the early 16th century, a hundred years before his time. This picture is based on one by Titian, making a conscious link between himself and the old Italian masters. At this time, he was occupied with a particularly large commission, a group portrait of Franz Banningkok's company of militia, the Cloveniers. Now usually known as the Night Watch, this is not only Rembrandt's most famous picture, but one of the most famous paintings in the history of European art. The picture has been subject to many interpretations, but there's documentary evidence that it's primarily allegorical in character. Dressed in the colours of Amsterdam, red and black, Franz Benningkok, the captain and chief client, is issuing an order to his lieutenant to bring the musketeers to attention. Each of the men had had to pay Rembrandt 100 guilders for the picture, which was intended for the newly erected militia house, along with pictures of other companies. But alongside the 16 militiamen clients, Rembrandt has included other figures. Particularly important is the brightly lit girl in the foreground, ostensibly portraying a street trader, but in fact bearing the symbols of the Clovenias, the cock's claws on her girdle with their emblem. To judge by her face, it's likely that the model was Rembrandt's wife, Saskia. It was the last time she was to perform this function. Following the night watch, Rembrandt received no major commissions for a long time. The fashion in Amsterdam was now for French painting, with its classical courtly style, rather than for the light and shade of Rembrandt's pictures. Rembrandt was no longer in vogue and was forced to change direction. Increasingly, he travelled out to the surrounding countryside. He made sketches on the spot, which he turned into etchings back in his studio. This landscape with Angler depicts a scene in the southeast of Amsterdam. The sky is cloudless. Rembrandt's skies were mostly white. Even at the time, Rembrandt's views of Amsterdam were famous. Here is one from the southeast.
Saskia had often been ill since the birth of Titus. On the 5th of June, 1642, she made her will. Titus was named sole heir, with a lifetime interest going to Rembrandt, who was also appointed the administrator of her estate until his death or remarriage. A week after she made her will, she died. After 15 years of steady development, Rembrandt had arrived at a point where he either had to change his style radically or at least modify it. By the late 1640s, he was no longer depicting hero figures like Samson, who could be identified with the Dutch War of Liberation. He now concentrated on other themes, in which the emotions played a stronger part. His picture, Susanna and the Elders, brings out in gripping fashion the conflict between young Susanna and the lecherous old men. The innocent girl is helpless in the face of the gross solicitations of the elders. After all, they are judges, and their hypocrisy is perhaps the worst aspect of the story. They had been peeping on Susanna bathing. When she rejected their approaches, they accused her of immorality. The story has a happy end for Susanna. It's not she who is sentenced to death, but the elders. In 1647, Hendrika Stoffers joined Rembrandt's household as a maid. She became his lover and took care of his son, Titus. Rembrandt could easily have found another rich wife, but he preferred to live out of wedlock with this country girl, illiterate like most of her class. She too served as a model. When Hendrika became pregnant with Rembrandt's child in 1654, she got into trouble with the church authorities. She was accused of living in sin with Rembrandt the painter and is therefore to be punished, admonished to repent and excluded from the Lord's Supper. A few months later, a daughter, Cornelia, was born. In paintings dating from the 1650s, such as this self-portrait, Rembrandt applies the paint with a broad brush or even with a spatula. The look on his face, which now bears the first signs of old age, reflects his unbroken self-confidence. Expensively dressed, he presents himself in commanding pose. The stick in his hand can also be interpreted as a scepter. The big, quiet hands are as relaxed as his gaze. The calm in the picture is achieved by the horizontal and vertical lines which now dominated his compositions. Rembrandt had never bothered to pay off the debt on his house, but gradually his creditors grew more demanding and less patient. Rembrandt tried in vain to transfer ownership to his son Titus, and he was threatened with the debtor's prison. He went into voluntary bankruptcy. In 1658, his house was auctioned off to pay off his debts. Titus had by now grown up. He and Hendrika set up an art dealing business in which they employed Rembrandt in return for board and lodging. The painter had previously pledged all his income to the two of them, for he owed them money too. Five years later, Hinterreicher died after sharing his life for 16 years as muse and model. Rembrandt was left with an aging housekeeper and his nine-year-old daughter, Cornelia. In his loneliness, he returned to biblical story painting, in which he depicted human relationships with unusual intensity. This intensity comes out well in this picture of a couple, although its precise theme is uncertain to this day.
Rembrandt's painting technique was disparaged by contemporaries as mere splashing around. But painters of later centuries continued to be inspired by the brilliant way he exploited his palette. In his day, Rembrandt was known throughout Europe. But soon after his death on the 4th of October, 1669, he fell into oblivion. Not until the 19th century was he rediscovered. He became the symbol of the type represented by the modern painter. Shortly before his death, Rembrandt portrayed himself once more, this time laughing. It's the laugh of a man who has attained much in life, even though he's well past the zenith of his fame. But this is not the laugh of a man suffering from self-doubt. He knows he has left posterity with a great legacy.